and welcome everyone to the Intrepid Museum's live virtual programming. Thanks so much for joining us today with a very special program on Intrepid Women. My name's Alicia and I'm an educator at the Intrepid Sea, Air and Space Museum here in New York City. I'll be your host for today. And just as a reminder, the museum's live streams are free, but if you'd like to support us in delivering our content, we encourage you to click on the link in the comments or in the description. So feel free to use the chat today to say hello. Let us know where you're tuning in from. Let us know maybe if you've ever been to the Intrepid Museum before. And of course, if you've got any questions, you can put them there as well. Now, people love to come check out our museum. Here it is. You can actually see we are located in a historic World War II era aircraft carrier. It also served during the Cold War and the Vietnam War. And we've got lots of cool airplanes and helicopters, even a submarine on site, and of course, a space shuttle. Now, at the Intrepid Sea, Air, and Space Museum, our mission is to honor our heroes, educate the public, and inspire our youth. And we are going to do that today through a lens of a very often overlooked group of people in air and space history, women. Now, specifically at the Intrepid, throughout its 31 years in service, no women ever served on board. That's just how things were back then. But that said, it is impossible to pass through the ship's decks without encountering the impact of women in some way. Now, first of all, our ship is called the Intrepid. So does anyone happen to know what that word means? What does it mean to be intrepid? Tell me in the chat if you happen to know. And while you're doing that, let's rewind time a little bit here and look at how we got there. So women actually do have a very long and often underrepresented history in American military. And in fact, they have served in every major conflict in some capacity from the American Revolution all the way through present day. Many served as nurses, some uh, went undercover as spies, and some even went undercover as men so that they could fight, uh, you know, because women at the time were seen as too delicate to do so. Now, until recently, less than about 100 years ago, women's roles were said to be in the domestic sphere, and that really means at home. So they were expected to stay home and, you know, cook and clean and raise children and so. Well, in the 1800s, some women decided enough is enough. They wanted to have the same rights as men, the opportunity to vote and have different types of jobs out there in society. So they started off a huge movement. And last year, we celebrated the 100th anniversary of one of the accomplishments of that movement, the passage, of course, of the 19th Amendment, which gave many women the right to vote. But of course, that movement for equality is still going on today. Now, that said, we can certainly say that we've come a long, long way since then, and so much of that is because of the work of some very intrepid women. So, earlier I asked you to define the word intrepid for me, all right? And, you know, if you said things like brave and strong and fearless, that's exactly what that is. So today we are going to focus on some of those brave, intrepid women in the fields of air and space, which means we are going to start off right at the dawn of flight. Now, most people are familiar with the Wright brothers, of course, and their historic first flight in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. But after that point, aviation really started to take off north of there in the Finger Lakes region of New York State. So, it was in that area, in a town called Hammondsport, that a bicycle maker named Glenn Curtis was inspired by the Wright brothers to start putting motors on those early glider planes. So this right here is a drawing of one of his creations that he called the June Bug. But unlike the Wright brothers, who were very, very secretive about their work, Curtis invited people to come and experience these demonstrations. And of course, once word spread that he was creating these new flying contraptions and showing them off, people came from all around to see them and even to learn how to fly with him and see what he was up to. And one of those people was a woman by the name of Blanche Stewart Scott. Now, she soon became known as the tomboy of the air. She was born in 1884 in Rochester, New York, and was actually an early enthusiast of the automobile. Though bear in mind, everyone, I do say automobile quite loosely here. This was the turn of the century, so they weren't really what we know of as automobiles today. Uh, in 1910, though, at the age of 26, she was contracted by a car company to drive across America in a publicity stunt. So she was accompanied by a female reporter, and she drove all the way from New York 
all the way across the country to California, stopping along the way at a number of the company's dealerships. And overall, the trip was a huge success. She got a ton of money for it. But why is this all important? Well, it caught the eye of Glenn Curtis. He was really impressed. And so he offered to give her flying lessons. In fact, she was the only woman to receive instruction directly from him. So on September 3rd, she began her lesson. She had put a limiter on the throttle of the airplane to prevent it uh, from going fast enough to actually getting airborne while she was just taxiing around practicing on the ground. But three days later, while practicing, something happened. Either the limiter moved or maybe just a big gust of wind blew and it lifted her little biplane up 40 feet into the air before then set gently uh, setting her back down onto the ground for a gentle landing. Now her flight was short, more than likely unintentional, but Blanche Stewart Scott is therefore credited as being the first woman to pilot and solo in an airplane in the United States and yeah, might have been all by accident. But she ran with it. So she went on to become a professional pilot. She became the first woman to fly at a public event in America. And she also became a very accomplished stunt pilot known for flying even upside down and performing these death dives from you know, 4,000 feet up. And then she'd go down and suddenly pull up at just 200 feet from the ground. And she also became the first female test pilot. But she eventually decided to retire from flying after just six years because she grew a bit bothered by the public's interest in air crashes. And so, you know, the fact that the aviation industry also just didn't allow any opportunities for women to become mechanics or engineers themselves. So by the time she passed away, all the way in 1970, at the age of 79, she had actually accomplished quite a bit as a pilot, yet never actually applied for a pilot's license, nor even a driver's license. They were still so new at the time that she, you know, got involved with them that they didn't really even exist yet. So good for her. Now, speaking of licenses, though, Harriet Quimby was the first woman to actually receive her official pilot's license in the United States. In 1903, she was 28 years old and she had moved from Michigan to New York City to work as a theater critic and a journalist. But a few years later, she decided to get involved with aviation. She had attended this thing called the International Aviation Tournament at Belmont Park on Long Island. And she started talking about aviation in her articles. She also started encouraging flying as a sport for women. And then just one year later in 1910, she took her pilot's test and became the first American woman to earn an official Aero Club of America Aviator Certificate. Now, Quimby became known as one of the country's very few female pilots. Obviously, she was the first to get it. And uh, she famously embraced her femininity, though, by wearing this specially made plum colored flight suit that you can see there in this picture. So she said, if a woman wants to fly, first of all, she must, of course, abandon skirts and don a knickerbocker uniform. That basically means pants. So her famous one piece hooded purple suit was made of thick wool back satin. And what was so amazing about it was that it was designed so that it could be converted from pants to a dress just by adjusting the buttons down the inner legs. So it was convertible fashion. How awesome is that? She famously actually wore this flight suit. And a few years later, appropriately enough, a grape soda company called Vin Fizz even recruited her as their spokesperson and used her image in that you know famous purple aviator suit uh, for a number of their advertisements. Now, Harriet Quimby also became the first woman to fly across the English Channel, but her accomplishment unfortunately didn't get too much press because, believe it or not, the day before she did it, the Titanic sank. And that, of course, was all over the press, so people obviously were a little bit distracted that next day. Understandably so. But women like Blanche and Harriet were remarkable for their time. So you have to remember at this time, at the turn of the century, women were facing a number of barriers that made them unable to fly commercially or with the military. And they were also under constant scrutiny, too, down to everything, uh, even like what they wore. Now, one famous aviatrix of the time even said, Male pilots could look like deep sea divers or humanoids with braided faces from Mars, and reporters loved it. The eerier, the better. But let one of us women have a hair out of place or a smudge on her nose, and it would be triumphantly hailed coast to coast as a reason for women belonging in the home. Now, that was Eleanor Smith, who we will talk about in just a bit, but that really shows you they really had a lot of scrutiny going on there at the time. 
Now, it was around this time that World War I was happening. And all of the new flying fields that had popped up, particularly actually out on Long Island, were starting to get converted to training fields for pilots who were heading overseas to fight. Now, Glenn Curtis, that bicycle guy, he built around 10,000 planes that he called Curtis Jennies for use in training. And although pretty much every pilot trained on them, none of those planes actually saw any action overseas in Europe because at the time they couldn't fly there. This was so long ago that they weren't actually technologically sophisticated enough to fly that long distance across the ocean. So when the pilots were done training, all the planes that they trained on stayed here in America. And the pilots then went overseas and flew European planes. And that, of course, meant that when the war ended, there were a lot of extra planes left over here. So the government decided to sell them off to private citizens for really cheap. They were practically actually giving them away at that point. And that is what is considered to kick off the golden age of flying. So it was this incredible opportunity for the masses, men and women alike, to learn and to experiment with flight. And the country at that point then were introduced for the first time to barnstormers and wing walkers and flying circuses. So these are people who performed aviation acrobatics and death defying stunts. This was a time, everyone, where aircraft was really pushed to their limits. And these people would literally, as you can see in these pictures, hang from planes high above the ground. And they would perform these gimmicks like playing tennis and shooting targets or dancing high up on the planes, even jumping from plane to plane all the way up there in the sky. But it wasn't just former military men doing this. A number of women were also barnstormers. Uh, for instance, the woman on the bottom right there, Catherine Stinson, she was the first woman in the world to perform a loop in an airplane. And also Pancho Barnes on the top right, she went on to be a movie stunt pilot and even founded the first stunt pilots union. But another really amazing woman of the era who began as a famous barnstormer was Bessie Coleman, also known as Queen Bess, who was the first African-American woman and first woman of Native American descent to receive her pilot's license. So she grew up in Texas. Her father was of Cherokee descent and her mother was African-American. And she became interested in flying at an early age, which was really only peaked when she started to hear all of these war stories from pilots who were returning home from World War I. Now, at that time, there was no training opportunities. All right, There were no training opportunities for African-Americans, for Native Americans, or women, <laughs> really, in general. So she took a second job at a chili parlor to save money, and she earned sponsorships to be able to go to France for flight school because they did have opportunities for those demographics. Now, in 1920, she traveled to Paris, and she learned to fly in a biplane, just like the one you see here, similar to those Curtis Jennies being flown in the United States. And one year later, she earned her pilot's license. Now, she's quoted as saying, the air is the only place free from prejudices. I know that we, African Americans, had no aviators, neither men nor women. And I knew the race needed to be represented along this most important line. So I thought it my duty to risk my life to learn aviation. She quickly realized, though, that in order to make a living as an aviator, she'd need to become a barnstorming stunt flyer and perform those dangerous tricks. So she took on the name Queen Bess and made her first appearance in an American air show in 1922 at an event honoring veterans of the all-black 369th Infantry Regiment of World War I. And the show billed her as the world's greatest woman flyer. And honestly, she probably was at the time. Now, Bessie Coleman was known for her flamboyant style and her determination, and she would stop at nothing in order to complete a difficult stunt. She even once broke a leg and three ribs when her plane stalled out and crashed, but she kept going. And she was committed always to promoting aviation and combating racism as well. So she spoke to audiences across the country about these goals, and she absolutely refused to participate in any event that didn't allow the attendance of African-Americans. Now, she had always wanted to set up a school specifically for young black aviators. But sadly, she passed away in a tragic crash in 1926, just a few years later at the age of 34, before she could do so. 
She had just purchased a very poorly maintained plane in Jacksonville, Florida, and she hadn't put on her seatbelt that day because she was planning a parachute jump the next day, and she wanted to be able to look over the cockpit to see the ground below. But about 10 minutes into the flight, the plane unexpectedly went into a spin dive and crashed. But that said, her memory has certainly not been lost. She has since been honored by numerous Hall of Fames, and she now posthumously has her name attached to a number of libraries and schools, just like she always dreamed. So fearless stunt flyers like Bessie Coleman went on to push the boundaries of aviation. They performed these demonstrations of planes and air shows. They broke records of all kinds, including our next intrepid woman, Eleanor Smith. So she is a teenage daredevil and record breaker. Uh, she found her fame after illegally flying her plane under New York City's four East River bridges love her. So Eleanor Smith was no stranger to airplanes. She grew up on Long Island and even took her first flight in a potato patch at just the age of six years old. But it really left a huge impression on her. And after persuading her parents to let her take flying lessons, she made her first solo flight at the age of 15. And then just one, years late, one year later, she became the youngest licensed pilot in the country at just 16 years old. Well, one day she was out hanging around the hangars on Long Island when a wandering barnstormer strolled in and he had actually just had his license revoked for trying to pull a stunt by flying under New York's Hellgate Bridge. Well, one thing led to another and a betting pool got formed that she, this plucky, headstrong teenager that she was, couldn't do the same thing. Now, Eleanor, of course, knew that she could risk losing her license if she didn't take the bet. But on the other hand, you know, she uh, didn't want to disappoint all of her fans. So she ended up taking the bait, but she upped the ante by aiming to fly under not one, but all four of the East River bridges. So all that week, she scoped out the river. She checked out the tides and the clearances of all those bridges. And then on Sunday, October 21st, today, she climbed into her plane and headed off towards the East River. Actually, a quite a nice day today for her to be doing something like that. So she first flew under the Queensboro Bridge, where she got off to an unexpected start and had to nearly weave her way through a bunch of hanging ropes and weights from construction that was going on up above her. But then she passed under the Williamsburg Bridge. She started to notice that the word had gotten out. Uh, there was definitely some uh, reporters, some press all up there lining the bridges. So she started to get a little bit nervous that she might get in trouble, but she kept going. Next up was the Manhattan Bridge. Same thing, even more reporters lining it. But at that point, she figured, you know what? She was halfway through. There's no turning back now. So as she was flying along, she wobbled her little airplane to say hello. She even blew them up a kiss. And then finally, as she approached the last bridge, the Brooklyn Bridge, she was in for the surprise of her life. She noticed that there was a tanker and a Navy destroyer passing one another directly underneath that bridge. But at the time, she was moving so fast and getting so close that she realized she wasn't going to have time to fly over the bridge there or even around them. So thinking really quickly as she was flying along, she decided to flip her plane sideways and she flew right in between the two ships. So at 17 years old, Eleanor Smith became the first and only person to ever fly under all four of New York City's bridges in an incredibly dangerous and incredibly illegal stunt that made her famous. Now there is one picture of that event and here it is. So this is, uh, <laughs> this is a picture of her flying under the Williamsburg Bridge and you can see her plane circled there in red, right in the center. Now, believe it or not, the city took pity on her, um, probably because of her age. <laughs> her license was suspended by the mayor of New York but only for 10 days and posthumously, but you know, in retrospect there. And she also did receive a reprimand from the Department of Commerce. But in the same letter was actually a separate note from a secretary asking her for her autograph. So Eleanor went on to set a number of early endurance and speed and altitude records and was even voted best female pilot in the country in 1930 by her peers, uh, beating out even Amelia Earhart. And in 1934, she was also honored by being only the third person and the first woman to appear on the Wheaties box that you can see there on the right. So she later went on to become a test pilot for airplane manufacturers, as well as the U.S. Air Force. And then decades later, she got involved with the foundation that was trying to save a World War II aircraft carrier from the scrapyard. Now, that carrier's name was 
The Intrepid, which of course is now home to our museum, the Intrepid Sea, Air and Space Museum. So what a neat little connection that we have with her there too. So before I go on everyone, I wanna pause here and see if we've got any questions. Any questions at all? Uh, what did it take to get a pilot's license back then? Great question. So pilots uh, today, obviously, they require many, many hours of training. But back then in, let's say, you know, 1910, uh, the pilot had to be, first of all, at least 18 years old. Eleanor was actually an exception. Uh, and she they had to pass three main tests. So the first was that they had to simply just stay in the air for about three miles within uh, a, a course. And it was basically just kind of making figure eights for a while around some posts. And then they also had to make an altitude flight to about 150 feet up. And then while they were up there, successfully land after stopping their motor while in the air. So basically, you had to prove um, that you knew how to glide your plane back down safely if your engine were to cut out while up in the air. And that was pretty much it. <laughs> so that's what it took back then. It was still new. <laughs> they were still experimenting. Any other questions? Did Eleanor Smith know Amelia Earhart? Yeah, she did, in fact. So Amelia Earhart is, of course, the famous female aviator who went missing, and they never found her in the 1930s. Uh, so at that time, there weren't actually a ton of female pilots. There were definitely a bunch, but not a ton. And a lot of them hung out together quite a bit because they would actually all compete against each other all the time in the women's categories at meets because there was a separate category. So they were friends, and actually Eleanor and a few others were a bit worried about her personally, because if you are familiar with Amelia Earhart's story, uh, so much of it was really kind of tied up in the publicity of her life. So her husband, George Putnam, was obsessed with making her famous. So he actually did everything he could to hype her up, when in actuality, there is some question about her flying skills. And in Eleanor Smith's autobiography, she mentions that a few of her and you know her friends there were worried because they never saw her practicing at the fields. She was wasn't really up to speed on the gear and whatnot. And um, the, she also had a really interesting, awkward encounter where um, George Putnam, Amelia's husband, asked to hire Eleanor to fly as Amelia Earhart under the guise that she was just a mechanic. And then once they landed, uh, he wanted her to duck down in the cockpit so she wouldn't be in the photographs and stuff. Uh, so some interesting behind the scenes stories there, uh, a little questionable, a little curious, but yeah, she was a friend. And in fact, Amelia came to Eleanor right before she got married to that guy expressing some concerns. Uh, and Eleanor said, well, don't marry him, but she did anyway, and the rest is history. Um, but that is a great thing to mention because Amelia was really instrumental at bringing a lot of these women together, actually. And in 1929, she founded an organization called the 99s for female pilots that is still around today. So a really, really uh, important organization for them, too. All right. So as we move forward in time, everyone, the 1940s, of course, brought the United States into World War II. And women primarily took on support roles on the home front, building airplanes and ships for use overseas. And because the construction of warships like the Intrepid, uh, an aircraft carrier, required very specialized skills, they couldn't be created in mass the way that airplanes or smaller ships were. But looking at the history of the Intrepid is actually a wonderful example of kind of what happened and how they got involved. So this right here that we're looking at is a newspaper clipping. This is talking about the creation of the Intrepid back in 1943. So for some history, everyone, the keel of our ship was actually laid in Newport News, Virginia on December 1st, 1941. And of course, just six days later, Pearl Harbor was attacked, which dragged a number of their male shipyard workers into war. So about 400 women were called in to temporarily fill in some of those positions to you know, keep up with all the wartime needs, uh, a couple of which you can see in this great photograph. And their presence was felt immediately. So what was estimated to take three years to construct, the aircraft carrier Intrepid, only took 17 months with their help. Now, just prior to its launch, on April 26th, 1943, the USS Intrepid was even christened by a woman. That there is Helen Smith Hoover with that big, beautiful flower on her chest. Uh, she's the wife of a Navy admiral, and you can see her there smashing a bottle of champagne against the Intrepid to christen it and send it on its way because that's what you do. And the other photo on the left there was a gift exchange between her and one of the welders from the shipbuilding yards. 
So these hardworking women who built planes and ships, they represent the Rosie the Riveter persona that is commonly seen on propaganda during this time. I'm sure many of you out there are familiar with it. They are women who left their jobs as laundresses and waitresses or office workers to take on more dangerous and dirty work for war. Now, the conditions were rough. And many didn't even have proper safe work attire, but it did allow them the opportunity to branch out into the workforce more, even if they were still only making half as much as the men. But with the manufacturing needs at an all time high during the war, even more workers were still needed. So the government started targeting middle class housewives with posters like the one you can see here on the right. And this is, you know, really tugging at their heartstrings. This says, the more women at work, the sooner we win. So from 1942 to 1944, the government launched publicity campaigns to really try to sell the importance of women doing their part for the war effort to meet production demands. And that is when the Rosie the Riveter campaign was really created. So two popular images of Rosie were painted on the left there by Norman Rockwell. The first all the way on the left is his Rosie the Riveter painting, which was even used for the cover of the Saturday Evening Post. Also in the center, you can see his Liberty Girl, Rosie to the Rescue illustration in the center that shows a young woman carrying tools of 31 new jobs that American women held at the time. So as you can see in this image, they were now acting as milkmen and mechanics and conductors and janitors and more. But probably the most famous in pop culture today is the We Can Do It poster all the way on the right there, which was created by J. Howard Miller for the Westinghouse Company. And it shows Rosie and her iconic red polka dot bandana flexing her muscle. We've probably all seen that, especially today during the pandemic, too. They definitely were trying to recycle that imagery to say everyone should go get vaccinated. Now, here is an interesting fact, though, everyone. Can you name this Rosie? All right, take a close look. Who is this woman? Let me know in the chat if you happen to recognize her face. Take a close look, see if she might be familiar to you at all. And I'll give you a little bit of a hint. The hair color might fool you. She definitely changed it later when she became a little more famous. So everyone, it is none other than iconic movie star, Marilyn Monroe. So of course, back then she went by Norma Jean Doherty. She was only 18. And this was, of course, before she became a superstar. But that just goes to show how everyone pitched in to help out with the war efforts. So she worked for 10 hours a day for $20 a week at the Radio Plane Company in Burbank, California, building basically what we would call today drones. Yeah, even back then. But what's amazing, though, is that that job might have kicked off her illustrious career because she won a $50 war bond after she was chosen as the queen of the company picnic. There you go. Fun fact. So World War II, though, also gave us female test pilots for the first time. And Grumman Aircraft in Bethpage, Long Island, also allowed women like Barbara Jane, Elizabeth Hooker, and Teddy Kenyon the ability to test the capabilities of aircraft in combat. So these women, who you can see here on the right, flew bombers and fighter planes. And the company, Grumman, also recognized that women might need a little extra help and a few extra hands as single parents at the time with the men overseas. So they showed their support by creating one of the first wartime nurseries for the children of their workers. Amazing. We should have that today for everyone. Now, nearly 400,000 new roles were created within the military reserves at the time, too, outside of traditional work as things like nurses, um, such as the WAVES, which stands for Women Accepted for Voluntary Emergency Service, who filled in as secretaries and air traffic controllers and translators, and also the WACS, W-A-C-S, which was the Women Auxiliary Corps who worked switchboards and radios and helped to break codes for people. There's another program we do called Code Breakers where you can learn some of your own. But meanwhile, the WASPs, W-A-S-P-S, which stands for Women Air Service Patrol, also known as the Fly Girls, flew training exercises and ferried new aircraft and equipment to their final destinations. So Jacqueline Cochran, who headed up the WASPs, was a famous record-breaking aviator who played a very important role in the inclusion of female pilots in the military. But before that, she was actually a businesswoman. 
Now, before taking up competitive flying, she was in the beauty industry and some of the most successful products of her cosmetic line called Wings to Beauty had been developed for the dry skin and the chapped lips that aviators often encountered during flight. Very practical. One of her most unique products actually was called the Perk Up Stick, and it had five beauty products in it. It had a cleansing cream, a rouge, a night cream, a foundation cream, and a powder, all in a small cylinder, kind of similar to a lipstick tube. And you can actually see her there holding that Perk Up Stick in the bottom picture, that black tube she's holding. Ingenious. Now, Jackie Cochran was actually born Bessie Lee Pittman. She was the youngest of five children in a very poor family in Florida who moved from town to town, setting up and reworking sawmills. Then at the age of 14, she married a man named Robert Cochran, and she gave birth to a son, Robert Jr., who sadly died at only five years old. But after the marriage ended a few years later, she decided to keep the name Cochran and began using Jacqueline or Jackie as her given name. And she became a hairdresser and eventually wound up in New York City where she was able to get a job at a very prestigious salon at Saks Fifth Avenue. Now, one day in the early 1930s, a friend offered her a ride in an aircraft just for fun, but it left, again, a huge impact on her. Flying tended to do that back then. And Cochran began taking flying lessons over at Roosevelt Airfield on Long Island. And she learned to fly in just three weeks. Then within two years, she got her commercial pilot's license. And she went on to be a huge proponent for the inclusion of women in air races. In 1937, she set a new women's world speed record, earning her the nickname the Speed Queen. And just one year later, she was actually considered the best female pilot in the United States by her peers. Then in the years leading up to World War II, she was part of something called Wings for Britain, which was an organization that ferried American-built aircraft over to England, which also allowed her to become the first woman to fly a bomber across the Atlantic. But knowing just how important this work was at the time, she wrote to Eleanor Roosevelt, encouraging her to start a women's flying division in the Army Air Force. She thought qualified women pilots could at least do all of the you know, non-combat aviation jobs that were needed to free up more male pilots for combat. So eventually, the Women's Flying Training Detachment, WFTD, opened up, headed by Cochrane. And in 1943, they merged with the WASPs, Women's Air Force Service, to create the WASPs that we talked about earlier. So as their director, she supervised the training of hundreds of women pilots throughout World War II and was quite possibly the first woman pilot in the United States Air Force. Post-war, she continued to set records like speed and distance and altitude and most famously became the first woman pilot to go supersonic. And that means faster than the speed of sound in 1953 while she was setting a world record of 652 miles per hour. But more fitting for us here at the Intrepid, she was also the first woman to land and take off from an aircraft carrier. Very cool. As well as the first woman to make a blind instrument landing, meaning that she couldn't see and had to rely only on her equipment. She was the first person to fly also above 20,000 feet with an oxygen mask. And in 1960, she even flew the Goodyear blimp. What can't she do? She still holds more distance and speed records than any pilot, everyone, living or dead, male or female. So an amazing woman and so honored to be able to highlight her today. Now, World War II also opened the doors for few uh, female air and space engineers, too, like Mary Golda Ross. Now, she became the first Native American aerospace engineer. She started her career at the airspace company called Lockheed, might have heard of it, during World War II. And at the time, women engineers were extremely rare. In fact, she was the only one in her whole division. But she ended up staying on the job for over 30 years, eventually even helping out with the early years of the space program. She had grown up in a small town in Oklahoma. She was the great granddaughter of a Cherokee Nation chief. She loved math and science. And eventually she became a teacher before moving to California to work for Lockheed on a number of top secret projects including the spy plane, the SR-71, as well as some of the early designs for NASA's rockets and plans for space travel. So just being exposed to these things back then, seeing others around them really made a difference and really inspired them to become the next wave of amazing female engineers too. Which leads us, of course, to the space age. But I want to pause here again and see if we've got any other questions before moving on. Any other questions about what we covered so far? Is Rosie the Riveter a real person? You know, that is a 
time honored question. So the idea of Rosie the Riveter applies to any woman who worked in a factory job really during World War II. But that said, there are some questions as to who might have been the original Rosie the Riveter. There are a few women who have been suggested for it. Uh, one of them worked in a Navy machine shop and was actually photographed wearing a polka dot bandana, just like in the images. Uh, another actually um, worked as a Riveter her name was Rosie at a bomb plant. Uh, and so, you know, there are a few of these, you know, anecdotal stories about women who maybe might have been the original, but it's really more about the idea behind the Rosie, right? Behind that Rosie the Riveter persona. Uh, and it's not really meant to be about any one specific person. It's meant to kind of include all of them together. So there's still much debate about who the original might have been, but it's about all of them. They're all Rosie the Riveter. <laughs> all right, any other questions? How many women went to work in factories during World War II? So overall, they estimate that there were over 6 million women that joined the workforce by the end of the war. And uh, at their peak, I think they said they made up about 37% of the workforce. So, you know, a pretty hefty chunk there. Um, specifically in defense, though, the percentage went up something like 500%, of course, from uh, the start to the end of the war. They needed more things. It was important because they had to make things like planes and bombs and things. Uh, and what's even cooler, though, is that there is documentation that they enjoyed it. So after the war ended, over 80% of them wanted to keep their jobs. But unfortunately, they didn't get to because, you know, the soldiers came back home and, and took over the jobs again, too. Uh, but it really was a huge step in proving that they were capable of doing this type of work. And it really did help them, you know, ride that wave into the future. Great questions. All right, so finally, everyone, we move into the space age and the growing momentum, of course, of the civil rights movement of the 1960s, really fueled again by the fact that women had the opportunity to go into uh, the workforce. So this period co coincided with the Cold War. This was a time, of course, where the United States found itself in a very tense space race with the Soviet Union in order to get to the moon first. And while most people working in the space industry at the time were men, there were certainly still a few women, just like Mary Golda Ross, who had been inspired by those before them working during the war. So a few uh, other engineers and mathematicians at NASA at the time were women like Dorothy Vaughn and Katherine Johnson, the latter of which you can see on the left there, uh, the African-American human computers at NASA, as they called them, uh, made famous, of course, by the movie Hidden Figures. Their calculations of orbital mechanics were essential to the success of our early space flights. And then on the right there, you've got Margaret Hamilton, who helped to develop the onboard flight software for NASA's Apollo program, which she's actually standing next to in that photograph. <laughs> they used a lot of paper back then. I love that photo. But another wonderful example of what women were still up against can be seen in the bar that had been set in the selection of astronauts. Now, during the space race, the Soviet Union was beating us to everything. They got the first satellite in space. They put the first animal in space. They even had the first man in space. But the United States was always really close behind. We were very close, but we kept getting beaten, even by just a few days sometimes, to certain achievements. Now, one of these events was actually getting the first woman into space. There had been some rumors of women in the Soviet space program, but NASA was very strict on their astronaut qualifications. At the time, in order to be an astronaut, you had to be under 40 years of age and in excellent physical condition. You had to have a height of 5 feet 11 inches or less. You had to hold a bachelor's degree or the equivalent in a science or engineering field. And you had to be a qualified jet pilot with at least 1,500 hours of flight time. So out of curiosity, let me know in the chat if any of you happen to qualify as a Mercury astronaut today. <laughs> Just curious. Now, while the majority of these qualifications could be accomplished by either gender, the last one, jet pilot experience, the one in gold there, could only be achieved by men because at the time, the military barred women from official military pilot training until the 1970s. So while not saying it outright, that qualification actually disqualified all women from meeting even the minimum requirements. Now, in 1959, the initial Mercury 7 astronauts were selected, but it made people start to think a little bit more about the qualifications. And a popular magazine decided to ask, why not a woman? Might they be just as capable as men? 
So they invited champion aviator and race car driver Betty Skelton to be the very first woman to undergo the Mercury Project's testing protocol at NASA for an article. They thought, yeah, she'd be the perfect candidate. She had a lot of relevant flight experience. And over a period of four months, she traveled across the country to meet with the Mercury team, as well as Soviet space scientists. And she braved a very intense testing regimen right alongside the Mercury 7 themselves. In fact, they were so impressed by her flying record and her skills that those seven guys actually gave her the honorary nickname Seven and a Half. Now, many of the experience, experiments rather that she underwent uh, tested the limits of what the human body could withstand. And you have to remember, going into space is not, you know, a walk in the park here on Earth, right? So in addition to a physical examination, she also performed over 80 tests, uh, including some that involved things like swallowing a tube to monitor her digestion. They injected dye to measure her liver absorption rates. They uh, monitored how fast her hand could close while also shocking her with electricity. Um, they had a vertigo test that involved squirting freezing water into her ear. She, uh, she also sat in a sensory deprivation chamber for hours to test her responses to isolation. And uh, she walked on a treadmill that gradually got steeper and faster to test lung capacity. She had to go through extreme heat, extreme cold, uh, and she worked, as you can see in this picture here, uh, underwater as well to study disorientation in near weightlessness, uh, even though she couldn't swim, but she actually didn't tell them that. <laughs> Now, throughout this process, though, she also noticed that the astronauts and the scientists would say or do things that made her realize that maybe they weren't really interested or even prepared to seriously consider women as astronauts at the time. There was one test where the administrators couldn't figure out what she should wear while lying on a tilting platform, that picture you can see here on the left. And at first they thought, oh, we'll just put her in a hospital gown. But then they thought better of it once they realized the table was going to go upside down with her feet in the air. So instead, they ended up giving her oversized men's pajamas instead. Some really funny pictures of her walking around in those. Now, even though the magazine article was obviously a bit of a publicity stunt, and she knew that, Betty Skelton took it seriously because she felt strongly that women were just as capable as men. And she was right. The article called her a petite example of the anatomical fact that women have more brains and stamina per pound than men. And this really fueled public interest. And a number of other women pilots became interested in becoming astronauts as well, which sparked another fascinating experiment on 13 women who are now referred to as the Mercury 13. So the doctor who had originally developed the Mercury program testing protocol for NASA set up his own privately funded program for women. And he even said it might be more practical from an engineering standpoint to send women into space over men because they generally weighed less. So they'd require less fuel to get them up into space. They would need less oxygen to survive. So it's actually pretty economical. So during his tests, one participant, Jerry Cobb, who you can see in the big picture all the way on the right there, she even passed in the top 2% of all participants to ever take the tests, male astronauts included. So the evidence was becoming pretty clear that women were qualified. But at the same time, this kind of scared NASA, who was already feeling the pressure to succeed in the space race, and they didn't want anything to go wrong or distract them from that goal. So they had the program shut down. Well, the ladies were upset as you can imagine, so much so that they met with the president. They took part in congressional hearings to get women into space. And in one of those hearings, John Glenn himself, the first American astronaut to orbit the Earth, even testified against them. And he said, quote, it's just a fact the men go off to fight the wars and fly the airplanes and come back and help design and build and test them. The fact that women are not in this field is a fact of our social order. <sighs> that hurts, right? Now, that might be kind of frustrating, maybe even a little surprising to hear today. John Glenn is, of course, one of our national heroes, and even he wouldn't back them up. Today, you know, there's so many incredible women doing all of those things that he just described, but back then, they weren't allowed. So sadly, nothing ever came of their fight. Until recently, but we'll get to that in a second. So one year later, in 1963, the Soviet Union beat us again and sent the first woman into space, Valentina Tereshkova. Now, don't get me wrong. It was a giant accomplishment for women worldwide. 
But as you can imagine, an incredible disappointment for all of the women who had tried so hard, those Mercury 13 and others, they tried to encourage NASA to change their policies and give women a chance. And what's even more frustrating is the fact that it would be another 20 years after that before America got their first female astronaut into space. Now, the 1960s really propelled the women's rights movement forward. And eventually, when the space shuttle program was launched in 1976, NASA finally began to encourage women to apply as astronauts. So six women were selected in that first class, including Sally Ride on the left, who also became the first American female astronaut in space in 1983. She had applied after seeing an advertisement in the Stanford student newspaper where she was a student and was one of the only 35 people selected out of 8,000 applications. So as could be expected, though, before her first historic flight, the media was all over her because of her gender. She was asked very silly questions like, will the flight affect your reproductive organs? And did she cry on the job? NASA even consulted with her about putting together a makeup kit for space, which she reminded them that that, of course, was completely unnecessary. And one talk show host even joked that the shuttle flight would be delayed because Dr. Sally Ride had to find a purse to match her shoes. You know, we had come so far and yet still had so much further to go. But regardless, Sally Ride made history in 1983 for everyone. 20 years, though, after Valentina Tereshkova took women into space. But Sally Ride has since paved the way for women in space ever since. And as of today, 82 other women have also officially become astronauts. Now, of particular note, Dr. Mae Jemison became the first African-American female astronaut in 1992. She's up there on the top left. Uh, to the right of her, a year later, Ellen Okoa became the first Hispanic woman in space. Then a year after that, down on the bottom left, uh, Kiyaki Mukai became the first Japanese woman in space. And in 1997, Kalpana Chala became the first woman of Indian origin in space. Then Eileen Collins, who you can see on the left there, became the first woman to both pilot and later command a space shuttle mission. And in 2019, just a couple of years ago, we also had the first all-female spacewalk. Can you believe it took that long, though? When Christina Koch and Jessica Meir, who are the two in blue furthest on the right in that picture, left the International Space Station together to do some routine maintenance. And of course, everyone, not to be, you know, undeterred there, coming up in 2024, the Artemis missions are going to send our first woman and next man all the way to the moon. So as you can see, even though historically they haven't frequently been highlighted, these intrepid women have played a very important, important role in air and space history through their hard work and their ideas. And they've paved the way for the rights and opportunities that are available for women today and tomorrow, the next generation, maybe even you all out there. So there are, of course, countless others who deserve to be celebrated, but we do feel honored to feature even just a few and to bring their stories to light for you today. Uh, and so I want to see before we wrap up if we've got any other questions as we round out the program. Did any of the women who did the astronaut tests get to go into space? There we go. All right. So for the most part, no, but also yes. And I'll explain why. So they were all, the Mercury 13, really, really qualified. But unfortunately, as I said back then, it just wasn't the right time. Many have passed away since then. But back when they were still launching space shuttles, they did invite them to NASA frequently to watch the launches from time to time. Uh, they were also there when Eileen Collins became the first woman to pilot the shuttle. That much I do know as well. Um, so they definitely followed the program. But none of them actually ever got to become astronauts with the exception, only recently, of Wally Funk. So you may have heard that name in the news when Jeff Bezos flew his Blue Origin New Shepard rocket into suborbital space this past July, only this year. She was 82 years old. She still is, I believe, uh, and became the oldest person to go to space until just earlier this month when William Shatner broke that record at the age of 90. But she was there for a while. So yes, one of them finally did get to go into space 60 years later. So, you know, you are never too old to achieve your dreams, everyone. We love Wally Funk. She is just incredible. Fabulous. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? How can I become an astronaut today? 
Great segue. Oh, all right. So astronaut requirements today have changed quite a bit since those early days of the Mercury program. Now, today, in order to become an astronaut, you have to be a U.S. citizen. You have to uh, possess a master's degree in a STEM field like science or math or engineering. You have to have at least two years of related professional experience or at least 1,000 hours of flight time in a jet. You have to be able to pass the NASA long duration flight astronaut physical. And they say you also have to have skills in leadership, teamwork, and communications. So then after all of that, after you've applied, NASA will review your application and then invite a small group of only the most highly qualified candidates in for interviews. And then from there, about half of them are invited back for second interviews. And then from that group, they select the new candidates. And then you're only just getting started. You spend the next two years learning basic astronaut skills, things like spacewalking, uh, how to move around the space station if that's where you're going, and flying jet planes, controlling uh, the robotic arm, things like that. And then, only then, maybe if you're lucky, you will get picked to actually go up on a mission. So it's a long process for sure, but it's worth it, I would say, if you have that chance. So everyone, uh, if you do have any other questions about our programs, you can feel free to reach out to us through our website, intrepidmuseum.org, or also through any of our social media platforms. I would like to thank you all so much for watching and sharing your questions and comments today. As you may know, the Intrepid has a number of live streams, so please do follow and subscribe to this channel, or you can also visit our website for the latest streaming schedule. Uh, also, if you enjoyed this or any other past program, feel free to click on that link in the chat to give us your feedback. We would love to hear it. Now, our next family program is Thursday at 3 p.m., and it's a good one, Spooky Space. So find out what spooky creatures lurk in the night sky as we explore the astronomical origins of Halloween and share a few haunting tales of unexplained phenomena that are witnessed by astronauts. So tune in streaming right here for that. Again, that is this coming Thursday at 3 p.m. Also tonight, tune in for our next Virtual Astronomy Live, everyone. So we'll be highlighting the upcoming launch of the James Webb Telescope with NASA scientists, and we'll take a look at some of those nebulas that Hubble has shown us over the years. So the pre-show starts at 5 o'clock tonight in just about one hour. You can tune in now on any of our platforms, Twitch, Facebook, or YouTube. So we hope to see you there, uh, and check out our website for any more information. All right, my friends. So once again, thanks so much for joining me today. And hopefully we will see you online for another upcoming Intrepid Adventure. Thanks so much, everyone. See you next time.